this on 31st of March, we just crossed, uh, we would be having an install capacity of around 22 gigawatt in the solar sector, as against target of around 100 gigawatt by uh, 2022. In wind, uh, we would have established, uh, we have established around 34 gigawatt against the target of 60 gigawatt. Uh, in uh, biomass, our uh, figure is 8.4 against the target of 10. And in small hydro, we have achieved uh, around 4.4 as against target of 5. So we are at around 68, 69 gigawatt as on 31, 3, 2018. As the technology is improving, the renewables are getting acceptable by the utilities because it is making now economic sense. We have had in India the Green Revolution, we had the White Revolution and as I say personally now, uh, there is an orange revolution taking place, it's a silent revolution in the energy sector. Uh, when we say have India reached the inflection point, in renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, what do we mean? Do we mean that uh, we are on target in terms of what we wanted to do? Or are we at a point where very radical change can occur in the coming years? And how does this all tie up with the biggest challenge before mankind and which is the challenge of global warming? Uh, to begin with, uh, let me introduce the panel and uh, the right of me, Dr. Arunabha Ghosh. He is the founder CEO of the Council of Energy, Environment and Water and his institution, though young, is ranked as one of the foremost think tanks in the sector. Then we have Dr. Suman Berry, who for almost a decade headed the National Council of Applied Economic Research in the country. Before that, he's worked for the World Bank and then most recently as the chief economist with Shell. Next to him, we have Mr. Chintan Shah, who is interestingly somebody who began with Terry, went out and had a very long and successful innings in the private sector and in the success story of the renewable energy sector, uh, which is Suzlon. And finally, we have Mr. Pankaj Kumar, who is the Secretary of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. So the issue we are discussing today becomes terribly important for the rest of the world. What India does in most other things is important, but it does not affect the world as much as what India does in the area of reducing carbon intensity of its economy. Because if India does what it should normally do, which is following the footsteps of the developed countries or more recently of China, then there is very little hope for the planet. So unless there is really a major change in what happens, the prospect for mankind in terms of global warming are rather bleak. So, so first set of question is, where have we got, what are the learnings from our experience? What could we have done differently? What have we done right? Which is different from what governments usually do. I have a slightly different narrative, but it kind of uh, mirrors the, the narrative that Mr. Shankar put forward. And I would say that there is not uh, one or the inflection point, but several inflection points that India has already been through. And if we understand why and when those happen, then it also helps us understand why we've been successful or not so successful and how we could go forward. Uh, the way I see the narrative un unfolding is that the renewable story begins in India uh, way back in the uh, early 1970s after the first oil crisis uh, when the Solar Energy Society of India set up. 
Um, through, since from then all the way until the late 90s, I would argue that we had uh, a period of renewables being treated primarily as a demonstration uh, technology, uh, whether through the government department or through individual researchers as, as well. Uh, what begins from the late 90s, and Chintan will is much more expert uh, than me on this, is that the wind story begins to, to unfold. And that carries on through the uh, first decade of the of the uh, of the century on the back in part uh, to a very attractive tax uh, incentives particularly through accelerated depreciation which allows a number of players to enter the market and of course on the legislative side it is also being driven by whatever was put forward in the in the LXT act and then comes the third inflection point uh, which is the launch of the national solar mission fourth inflection point comes in 2014-15 when we ask ourselves as a country how big could we get on renewables. So then the both the, the, the wind story and the initial phase of the solar mission gets conflated together into a much larger ambition for, um, uh, for rolling out renewables. Uh, Suman? Well, um, I'll respond to your question uh, more briefly because I'm not as knowledgeable. I worry a little bit about auctions as the mechanism for price discovery and whether there's going to be a winner's curse issue and uh, the whole issue of renegotiation risk. So you're asking what we did right. I mean, we are exulting in the fact that the auction mechanism has succeeded. I would like to, you know, put into debate the question of whether that was the best way of doing it. It came as a response to resource scams, etc. We've now decided it's the only way, to, the best way to go. I think the second point, which is sort of related to the first, is that bringing the private sector into electricity generation was relatively uh, uh, novel at that time. I think it was a response in part to the Rakesh Mohan Committee on Infrastructure. But what was important was that the UPA, despite being supported by the left, decided that they too continue down the path of inducting the private sector into generation. Why is this important? Because I would say that what happened in 2003 with the Electricity Act and the entire framework that was worked on by, uh, by the Planning Commission, by Gajendra Halvia, etc., prepared the ground for the notion that uh, renewables would largely be in the private sector. And I think that is huge, but I think it means that the issue of if you like, risk mitigation in the private sector is something that is on the agenda. I'll stop there. Uh, bidding has been a very interesting uh, uh, debate always for me, I don't know, always. Having come from the private sector, now in government, uh, as a manufacturer, what do you see as a manufacturer? You see two things. You see what the market says and what is the profitability, based on which you set up a manufacturing plant or you ask your vendors to set up manufacturing units. This helps a great in wind. Wind is about 90% indigenous in India. We don't import. We only import the critical components or maybe the supply chain basis we don't, like sale is too big a player to get your steel so you import from outside. But otherwise, everything is available in India. This is an interesting paradox that on the wind we make practically everything in India and solar we make nothing. Uh, Mr. Kumar, now the energy efficiency story and what is it that we did right? to achieve breakthroughs in areas where we have. My views goes to the way the civilization has used one and other form of energy in last maybe 500 years. In the, uh, I should say, over enthusiasm to go for renewable should not lose sight of the issue of our uh, what he, I can say, the whole ecosystem, what we could develop to harness fossil fuel, coal, our resource base, our technological capability, the issue of import, issue of resource geopolitics in the world, issue of uh, interest of MNCs, there also there are 
host lot of issues in energy efficiency ecosystem that we need to take care of. Thank you. Uh, where do we see ourselves getting and what is the ambition level that we could think of in a realistic manner? So, so for renewables, can we look forward to a year where we would repeat what Germany was able to achieve last year that on a good day in the daytime no fossil fuel was used for electricity. Now, if Germany could do that, can India today look at a date where this can happen and if so, what would it take? I would just uh, offer uh, three quick ideas uh, and they are related to some of the pathologies that have already been mentioned. Uh, the reason we are struggling with reverse auctioning now is because we are, whether we, whether the contracts are opened up for renegotiation or not, it is still a sword of Democles hanging over the developers' heads. And, and if it is hanging over the developers' heads, it is hanging over the investors' heads as well. And that is why you are bidding aggressively for what you think is the last bid on the planet. Right? Uh, so, what we need to do is not de-risk the technology, you need to de-risk the sector uh, from risks that are non-project related, whether that is uh, contractual enforcement or the off-taker, whether it is currency related, uh, 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 whether it is evacuation related and so forth. And for that we need financial de-risking. Second uh, big idea, um, well second idea whether it is big or small is up to you, is that we need significantly more consumer finance for renewables rather than just developer finance for renewables. Without that, we will not get into the big game of rooftop solar, the German example that you, uh, 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 that you uh, suggested. It is not going to happen unless people like us in the room really think of renewables financing as something as easy as is say housing financing now. So, we have got to think about renewables not just as an infrastructure sector, but as a consumer sector. Uh, and the third idea. Uh, which relates to both your manufacturing question as well as new frontiers is look, thinking about renewables beyond electricity. So, you begin to think about renewables not just as something that lights up your fans and lights, uh, but as something else. Similarly, community power. We got 750,000 primary schools in India. Every second primary school in India has no power at all. Every second primary health center in India has very poor quality power. These are new demand sources for renewables. So, that then creates an ecosystem or a market where you are beginning to innovate differently. You are not just thinking about manufacturing panels, you are thinking about the, the products that are going to use the energy that comes out of the panels. Is it efficient fans, lights, equipment, uh, baby in, uh, incubators, infant incubators, uh, vaccine storage, refrigerators, whatever it is. All that is also make in India. All that is also innovation. Why do we only have to think about replicating the manufacture of a panel as is done in China as the only route of make in India? To, to use an old uh, Yorkshire phrase, I believe, be careful what you wish for because you might get it. I do not think that we should be wishing for 100 percent renewables. I think that there is value in diversity. We are heading to perhaps the most diverse fuel mix that, that the world has known since the industrial revolution, which is uh, that there will be coal, there will be oil, there will be gas, and there will be renewables. And I think that is good, and I think that is good for India. We need to do enough, because it is in our interest, to encourage others to move down the technology curve. But exactly with, as with mobiles, as was mentioned right now, others should do the technological innovation, and then we need to do uh, the business model innovation and the financial innovation and I think that is plenty for us to do. I will leave it at that. The most ignored activity in the renewables uh, side is solar thermal. I think uh, why it has been ignored I do not know because it is 100 percent make in India yeah. and I would say on the IRR perspective it is always it is the best IRR, always solar thermal. You want a solar water heating system at your house will give you a payback in less than 3 years and solar thermal has been ignored for some reason or maybe the entire setup for the solar thermal as it should be has not been created, that environment has not been created. And I think this is what India has to push forward, we do not have to import anything, almost everything is available in India, can be fabricated in India. This was a very useful and interesting discussion 
on a topic of vital importance not only for India but for the whole world. We look forward to your comments on this topic in the future.